Hello, my name is Jodie Brunning and today you're listening to Physicians and Scientists for Global Responsibility. Today I am speaking with Professor Pablo Gregorini. When we first started talking about an interview, you said you need to, Jodie, you need to read this 2015 paper and that has informed you. And now this, this paper is, and I'm just moving back to it because you take a lot of notes when you interview Pablo mm -hmm. Gregorini, I tell you what. Um, this paper is called Our Landscapes, Our Livestock and Ourselves, Restoring Blo Broken Linkages Among Plants, Herbivores and Humans with Diets that Nourish and Satiate. So the metabolomic work comes directly from even this paper. And in this paper, you were talking about an attuned palate. And so we, we are educated to like certain flavours. And that, you know, the, the three interrelated processes include flavor feed, feedback associations, the availability of phytochemically rich foods and learning in utero and early in life to eat nourishing combinations of, of foods. So your, 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 this paper looked at this in terms of looking at animal experiences as well as human experiences. Can you talk about flavor feedback relationships and secondary compounds for animals? Yeah, yeah, yeah sure. Um, and that's fantastic. We, we started with Fred uh, a while ago, you know, maturing that hypothesis, right? And in fact, we started to talk with Fred while I was in the state. I think it was 2006 that we've been kind of maturing that hypothesis. And then Michelle Muret joined us and we, we put that paper together. And then we continue with another paper that I haven't sent you, which is grazing management, setting the table, designing the menu, uh, influencing the diner. When we set that hypothesis is that we are what we eat, eats, right? So literally, and, and that talks about, you know, how, like I mentioned before, we are a reflection of what we do to them, with them, with us, right? So, in that paper, as in other papers, we refer to, you know, that positive or negative feedback loop uh, that relate uh, the animal or connect the animal with the landscape. And, you know, by flavoring that landscape, the animal get in tune with that landscape or not. And then as the animal consume, you know, the animal uh, because it wants to consume something, because he may or she may have, and I'm saying he or she, not eat, right? Learn about. So that wanted to eat, wanted to act, stimulated, you know, that stimulate, motivate the action of the animal to go and eat, then liking or disliking that and learning, right? As a nutritionist, you know, we tend to forget about the plant secondary chemical compounds. You know, we used to call them anti-nutritional, right? But they have a, a multitude of myriad of benefits, you know, for plants to communicate amongst them, to for plants to communicate with animals, including us. And those components that were anti-nutritional or poison, we now know that they have a massive effect from a medicinal point of view and prophylactic point of view. And those are the things that we are exercising now at our pastoral systems here in, in New Zealand. Now, at least in, in, in my team and design farms and create healthscapes based on biochemistry, primary and secondary interacting, right? Rather than think of a mass or a yield, which is quite old in my opinion. Yes, dry matter which is what I learned when I was at Ag College. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, and second, and it's interesting because we talk about macronutrients, you know, fat, carbohydrates mm -hmm. and protein. And then we talk about micronutrients, vitamins and minerals, but you're talking about secondary compounds, yeah. phytochemicals, which can include carotenoids, polyphenols, isoprenoids, mm -hmm. phytosterols, saponins, and these, uh, you were talking about them having, um, I think, was it antimicrobial? Oh, they uh, have a, a, a multitude of benefits. And they were secondary originally because the content or concentration in the dried matter was minuscule. Or there were some components that weren't able to be measured. And then they call it secondary. 
but yeah. they are primary from a metabolic point of view of the animals and human. They are vitamins, coenzymes, and you name it all. You know, they're antibiotics, they're anti-inflammatory, you know, uh, protects, uh, they protects plant and animal from UVs. Antiviral, anti Antiviral, exactly. Anti-cancer and yeah, you name it. So what we are doing is call the nutritionist back and say, well, hold on. You learned that. That's good. That 101, let's go to a real holistic nutritional ecology and then once we get the whole thing nobody is more important than the other one nobody is primary or secondary or tertiary we are all playing a role in that whole to keep us alive and healthy and, and that's why we started to to consider those plan uh, of different phytochemistry, if you like, to not call it again secondary components, because they are essential. They are essential for for, for life. Absolutely, and and a really interesting example was where you were talking about um, by a paper by Aria, where you were looking at post yeah. post postprandial inflammatory responses, kangaroo versus wagyu meat. Yeah. And uh, we, yeah, we got, and that's how we started. And that's how we, we, we started to think, okay, we, we, we should be doing something, you know, in that experiment, this fantastic Australian work compare, you know, the, the proclamatory markers in human beings eating the, in a crossover as well, eating kangaroo versus wagyu, right? Nothing against the wagyu, nothing in favor of, 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 of the kangaroo, right? And they find out that, of course, the kangaroo was the healthiest one, you know, in terms of pro-inflammatory markers and cancer markers and et cetera. So I keep telling, which one would you feed to your mother-in-law or your father-in-law? And which one would you feed to your kid, right? Uh, as compared to a hyper-energetic diet to uh, an animal in a confined situation, which to me is an atrocity, or even yes. some of the winter crops like fodder beet. But that's my own opinion. We got scientific evidence to say that. And the more work but, you do around this, the more we can look at scaling up. The more you know, you're you're you're, you're working with Anita Fleming. She's a farmer, so and Charles Murfield forever is emphasising the need for our research and science to be conducted with farmers on farms. The idea of you know academic research that's outside you know that is outside and then sort of forcing knowledge on farmers oh, is um, exactly and, and that's key for us but you're continuing in the story of that australian experiment you know and that's why we, if you look at from that point of view there is a noise which is the animal and the diet and that is the reason why fred and i and then later on stefan van Vliet that join us say well let's disentangle that let's clean that up and that's why we you know, as Stefan is comparing feedlot diet versus pasture diet in the States, we want to step ahead, working with him as well, right? And saying, okay, well, how we can differentiate from a monotonous pastoral diet to a design functional diverse diet from a taxonomical and biochemical point of view. Stefan find out, you know, when, when this, this is not called the diet and the animal, that an animal in this particular case, bison's fed uh, in a feedlot diet, their metabol metabolism or the metabolomic profile look like a couch potato. Uh, while the, uh, the bison grazing on the rangeland is like a kind of an athlete. Well, and then we say, okay, well, that's good. An athlete on pasture, well, well let's see if we can improve even better that that pasture and that's why we went from a monotonous pastoral environment to functionally diversified pastures by design rather than the default and we find out these uh, uh, results not only in performance well being environmental impact but also human human health benefits yeah absolutely and it's it's really interesting because you, you if we're putting livestock back in paddocks where there's choice where there's grazing selection that is a lot strong we also if something's got you know out of control and seeded massively and it's got toxic you know that the stock won't handle it and so 
we have to sort of build that in and that's I mean that's the craft of farming well yeah definitely and that's one of the things you know we we learned with Fred you know talking with in several ranchers in the states you know and on other parts of the world you know if, if you like it's nothing it's nothing new farmers knew it that's why it is quite important to 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 work with farmers right and you know nobody can deny it that the advantage to be local you know but but the, the interesting thing is like um, we can work on that We've been talking about, you know, animal designs, you know, animals that we can design that or select for by the personality mm -hmm. to eat the best and combine it with the rest rather than to eat the best and leave in the rest. And that's why I had a fantastic PhD student a while ago, Dr. Kenna Garrett, now that works at Dairy and said now that um, we were um, evaluating, you know, how, uh, you know, functional diversity had an impact in utero and the performance and behavior of those uh, lambs in the future. And we we talked with, with her and also with Matt Beck, uh, Dr. Matt Beck now worked for the USDA, another former student of mine, in animal design in utero for emotions, you know. So we have evidence already now that we can emotionally design animals for future foodscapes and then shorten that intergenerational transfer you know if we were going to include animals into a foodscape you can work with the with the dams with the cows with the the use with the hind in a way that can adapt their progeny way faster to that environment it's somehow it's like a helping helping nature in in, in that manner Fantastic. And that that brings me to because we we I think we could talk for a lot longer than we're going to talk today. But um let's and let's done. look at the 2023 paper because that that brings brings us to the paper's title, which is Complexity, Crash and Collapse of Chaos, Clues for Designing Sustainable Systems. And that was done with um Hans Scheer from mm -hmm. the Netherlands, I think. And um that you know, you're you're thinking about complex adaptive systems, and you're you're talking about complexity rather than being being a complicated system. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that, please? Well, that's uh, okay. We were talking before we start this this interview. It's that's a thought that we've been brewing for a long time. Yeah. Um, um, Long story short, um, we need to embrace complexity and we embrace complexity, complexity, acknowledging that it's not complication. And embrace, in embracing complexity will reduce complication and complex, uh, complicated matters at the time of managing a landscape or farm. Technical. Oh, yeah, exactly. So in that complexity, you know, the, the, the good metaphoric expression is like a uh, system have got that complex that we need to use multiple tools and knowledge hunger, knowledge hunger to, to deal with that. Nobody can fix a computer with a hammer nowadays, right? So we, we deal with that in this paper about how we can embrace and use complexity to enhance flexibility, adaptability of those systems through time. Acknowledge that we need to look at that complexity that may look like a, a ball of nothing, a cloud of points at some point. But as we deal with that and we we'll give it time, that chaos will collapse into patterns that will determine a behavior an adaptive behavior of that system to that particular thing. So the papers go uh, goes on and on, you know, till we acknowledge that uh, and we argue that we should go to that complexity and that complex science that may relate even to our being and our consciousness. Yeah, because farm, farming, of course, is overlaid as a complex system. You've got economic you know you've got the farmer's need to pay a mortgage you've got 
the ecology of maintaining the soil, not micro, you know, not, not mining the micronutrients. You've got rural life that's being healthy and happy in communities. And you've got the farmer's short term interests, you know, getting good reproduction rates, which which also ultimately might be long term interests. Yeah, well, and exactly before was, you know, if we look at New Zealand and other systems around the world was before, OK, well, let's produce as much fat as we can per unit of area. So we grow grass, we water that grass and we use nitrogen. Cool. That gave us um, some sort of wealth, if you like. Right. But things have changed. That was pretty much an uh, monetary demand, if you like. But now we got not only the profitability, productivity. So there are two different things, right? The farmer needs to be profitable, but the industry needs for the farmer to produce more and more because of whatever reason. Then the environmental um, stewardship for the farmer, that the farmer is, it's, it's cold now. It's like we say, society say, oh, what environment? you know, your livestock, or what environment, or what health, your fault, or something like that, right? But, so the farmers need to deal with a lot of things at the same time, and kudos in the farmers that lately they have been treated like the scapegoat, right? But while we need to acknowledge no farmers, no food, no food, no us, right? There is no farm, no farmer that, you know, is trying to do the things wrong, right? But just going back to that complexity, that myriad of demands now that the farmer uh, or the agricultural uh, communities or the country communities face is completely different and stressing in several points. So, like I said, nobody in their right mind will go and fix a computer with a hammer. So that's why I said, let's embrace complexity because yes. by embracing it, we reduce complication. We reduce complicated matters. Yeah. So I can go into details of that paper. It, it get even to a philosophical, uh, philosophical angle that you need uh, several bottles, bottles of red wine to get it. <laughs> I know, right? I I consumed that while I was reading it. No, I need to. Um, and and so you know, and the the idea of the complicated but solvable is different. Uh, you know, and you were say, assuming ceteris paribas all other things remaining equal. Well, they're not. <laughs> well, uh, that's one of the things that, you know, we, we point out and, you know, I got another PhD student that was working and designing healthscape in our high country. And we find out that when we literally assume that ceteris imparibus rather than ceteris paribus, right? Like you say, ceteris paribus is one thing, ch one thing changed, nothing changed. And that's the good old approach, right? And he's still wandering around with, okay, that reductionist point of view help. I'm not denying that because I even my team do reductionist uh, science as well. But when you look at systems, system designs and complex adapt adaptive systems, you know, you need to embrace that set that is in paribus. Is that that butterfly effect? You know, you change one thing, everything change. As you say, seeking chaos rather than avoiding it. Exactly. And just seeking chaos, embracing chaos, and detect those patterns that Mother Nature and on the farming per se experience of the farm, the farmer living and being part of the land will help to collapse. Yeah. And I think that's where it's really, for me, I consider that while there is really good science going on in New Zealand, we don't have the extension services, the feedback loops into the farming communities. And I know like my, you know, I'm speaking to someone and they're a dairy farmer and they're just sick of being told the same thing for 20 years by Dairy NZ because they're, they're actually ready to change, but they're not sure where to go. And so they're getting a lot of a lot of information from you know farm co farmer colleagues, but if the other farmer colleagues don't know, they won't change either. And it, there's there's it's incumbent upon the government to 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 help farmers understand the potential new science. Yeah, but it, and, it, and I, th I think if I'm not wrong, there, there, uh, there is an incipient uh, kind of 
mimicking the, um, the extension services of the universities in the States, the universities in the States of the USDA, like an extension. So I think something has been set up or it's being set up by hiring consultants and, and make them extensions, which is a really good move from MPI. I think it's MPI. Uh, but, you know, but also would... it depends on the view of, of, of how you look at the system as well. You know, that brain dumping, I don't think that work or just let me help you because I know more. I don't think that. No, that won't work. With the farmer, you know, it's just like, we said, well, let us help each other. Because yeah. if, if you do the things right, it's going to go well for me as well. If you take care of the land as you've been taking, it's going to go well for everybody. You know, if you, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's, if, if farmers aren't autonomous, they actually, they turn into technical um, robots. They they actually can't farm because, yeah. because of these open-ended systems they're dealing with. Exactly. And with that came, you know, the, the lack of sense of belonging, the lack of, you know, that's a resource, right? The lack of embracing that cultural approach, like ko te whenua, ko te whenua, ko o. I'm the land, the land is me, right? And if you don't embrace that, you know, yeah. yeah. We can do it. Yeah. Well, I'd like to. I'd like to thank you. I I would like to keep talking, but I'm not going to. Thank you so much um, for today, and um, we're just when as well as you you as well as that when you were finishing off this paper, you also um, you commented you had there were four other sayings, and one of them was Descartes, and the the need to doubt until it is certain, and and being 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 looking being able to look critically at the emperor's new clothes the other one was churchman the maturity is the capacity to yeah, the maturity if i recall it correctly the maturity is the capacity to embrace two paradigms preferably opposite at the same time and bolding who who as as a choice for values one can distinguish three modes of social control exploitation trade and love and you know, every farmer I know loves their land. They love the rivers that run by their land. They love their soil and they, they damn well love their cows and mm -hmm. sheep, except probably when they're, um, oh. <laughs> when they're drenching oh. or whatever. Oh. <laughs> um, okay. And okay. the other one. Yeah. So go pardon. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. And the, and the final one was from the book of Genesis, Cain, where is your brother? Which was, I, I thought that was a lovely way to finish because of course that, that to me brings us back to communities and to, to humanity and, and who we are as people. Yeah. And, but from all those sayings, like I keep saying, I'm maturing. I'm not yet mature. I hopefully let's can help each other to mature. There is no one side of, of the other. There is no, I'm this, you are. You know, that uh, there is no love your enemy. I'm a Catholic, but anyways, I, I think even in that sense, you know, point, okay, you are bad, I'm good. But you are regenerative, I'm conventional. You, uh, there is no that. Yesterday I was a fan of the chief. Now I'm a crusader supporter. So the I am, you know, I understand that I am put us in a comfortable place where we can find our ghetto, our tribe, our thing. But let's ignore that we are one whole thing that travel that space and time. Uh, because at the end of the day, the only constant in life is change. And we, by change, can embrace not only complexity, but help each other to mature. And it's all based on really good information and and bad information too. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you again, Pablo Gregorini. Uh, it's been uh, just a pleasure interviewing you today. Oh, thanks so much, Jody. Anytime, I feel free to give my uh, email uh, to the audience if they want to contact me or want more technicalities other than the philosophical lecture. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much. No worries.